Thank you very much. Uh, and many thanks for inviting me to this interesting conference. And to let me comment, I will say just these two papers uh, that were really interesting and challenging in some sense. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to give any comment to Eduardo Gomez's presentation for logical reason he's not here and the second one is I really don't know too much about the topic uh, so the only thing I have are questions to Eduardo he's not here so okay uh, uh, beginning with Andrew presentation uh, my first reaction may be Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it's, like, it's quite interesting to see how in Europe things that we were discussing in the 80s and the 90s are now in the top of the agenda in some sense. Uh, not only in this thing, I mean, for instance, in financial topics like yeah, yeah. the debt, etc., 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 it seems that at this moment Europe is coming behind Latin America. <laughs> like uh, they are uh, having some some topics, some discussions, debates that we did like two or three decades uh, ago. Uh, but at the same time, and this I think is the I, I really uh, mm, celebrate that some of these topics are still important. <laughs> I mean, it's like. Uh, Maybe we, we just believe that, ah, we know what universalism is, and you know, we know, and, and, and there's a lot of things to discuss about that. Uh, and I had the chance to discuss Julian and Diego's book personally with them oh, yeah. before they published the book. And uh, it, it was part of the discussion. I mean, it's like, uh, it was quite difficult for them and for all of us, and it still is quite difficult to define universalism, but at the same time, we are sure that this uh, discussion is quite interesting. This is the, the first thing that... And after, uh, after uh, listening to, to both of you, I, I, I really think that the first conclusion is that uh, we still need to uh, have a clear understanding of the of the different concepts that are guiding principles of uh, the social protection systems organization. We still need that. And just give you an example to Renata's presentation, and, and thank you very much, Renata, uh, for, for, for it. I mean, it's like uh, many years ago to talk about a system of social assistance programs were a contradiction in terms. I mean, like social assistance programs are programs absolutely differentiated one from the other and with a specific topic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and I mean, it, it looks like uh, at this moment we have uh, many arguments in order to say that we have a system there too. Uh, I, 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 I'm not able to discuss the characteristic of the system, but it's quite interesting to see that we can analyze, at least in the Latin American cases, the social assistance program as a systemic uh, organization. I think this is one of the main uh, lessons of Renata's presentation uh, on, on the Brazil experience, but at the same time, there I find also uh, a lot of questions, uh, uh, maybe it was not clear that, but we still don't know what program has to, to be included <laughs> within the system. For instance, you told me that at this moment, for instance, the, the beneficial prestación continuada was supposed to be there, and now they are planning to move this to the pension system. And I mean, still, it's not a clear uh, space, political space, this uh, system of social assistance. I think this is a second interesting lesson that what we include there and how we can put in the same bottle different programs that uh, they look like 
have the same objective, but normally they don't. And even how we can put in the same system programs that are at such different levels of state uh, management. I mean, like, is, is, is my, my, at the same time, it's a question. I mean, it's like, do we have any evaluation, for instance, Renata, of, 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 of how this system functions as a system? That, that's a question. Sorry, I want to mix the two presentations. Uh, <clears throat> back to Andrew again. Uh, but I have to find my notes here, here, <coughs> here. <coughs> Uh, one question I think that arises from, from your presentations is, is the following, I mean, uh, this, this idea of substitution, uh -huh. yeah? complementary or uh, <coughs> additional substitution. I think it's a quite interesting question. And, not only, uh, not only within the same, let's say, uh, area, for instance, is private uh, health substituting public one or things like that, but look at experience here in Brazil. Uh, Brazil is the only country in the world, as far as, as I know, that has approved a universal basic income for everyone in the country, as a law. A long time ago, 1995 uh, was that? 91? 90? 90? Yeah, more or less. Okay. But <laughs> in the same day, they approved the Bolsa Familia program. Supposedly, for some people, a lot of papers written on that, it's going to be the first step in the direction of the uh, universal, unconditional benefit. So after many years, it looks like there is a substitution. <laughs> Not, you know, uh, I mean, Bolsa Familia took out of the debate not uh, only uh, not only, not only uh, 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 out of the agenda, but a law. And nobody knows uh, how it's going to be reinforced. I think what I'm trying to say is that there are many places where this substitution uh, her addition, uh, and also what we are we are seeing here in, and I still don't don't know any any paper with uh, statistical data that what happened in Latin America. I want, sorry, Latin America is is as complex as Europe. Sometimes we talk about Latin America, and I mean we have to talk country by country. I think this is another lesson of this. Uh, of, of this table that any any country experience is different. That's the difficulty of Spin Anderson and all these people that sometimes they want, um, but at the same time, if they want, you want to compare, you have no other uh, way to go that to find some similarities, otherwise you cannot compare anything. But uh, in, in talking about country specificities, uh, what we see in, 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 in at least in, in, in Brazil, in Argentina, Uruguay, you, you may, may be wrong, but I don't think so, is that along with the advance, for instance, of cash transfers, there is cash transfers that are requiring conditionalities in health and in education mainly, we see an advance of private education and private health. This is a tendency. This is a statistic. Question is, again with the substitution, <laughs> is there any relation? No, I mean, questions like, Maybe this kind of conditionalities reinforce the idea or the segmentation that public services, health and education are for the poor and not for the other ones, and, and the middle classes, or, or, or not middle, I mean, the low middle classes even, they are trying to go out because at the same time, these kind of programs are not complemented with 
investment in health and uh, education so to have a good quality of services in these areas. Uh, and I think there is uh, another interesting question would like to listen what is your reaction on that. Uh, another, I think Andrew put a good question that is also old one but still needs to be uh, re resolved. Uh, this idea of uh, do uh, social expenses, let's put it in this way, help or consolidate segmentation, social segmentation, etc. It's an old question. Uh, what came first? And I think that here is it, related with this, Anna, is that when when uh, the main institutions of social protection system, I think this is true for Europe and even for the most developed countries in Latin America, were built, when the basis of the, this system were built, we had at that time a more homogeneous society. Maybe we had more poor at that time, <laughs> yeah? but we had a working class, more homogeneous, and building a uh, universal systems where quotation easy uh, for this and now as you said inequality is the main characteristic of, of our societies we have a more unequal labor force and in this sense quotation the incorporation of the uh, female labor force to the market in the last two or three decades increase I'm not complaining of that incorporation, but I'm just talking about fact. Increase uh, the segmentation in the labor market. And so, in some sense, in, the, in, the, in reality, we are moving to the uh, scenario that the economists want. <laughs> They're talking about your points of the economies. I mean, it's like. Uh, and in this scenario is where uh, cash transfers came. And maybe the conclusion is that, okay, cash transfers consolidate segmentation, but at the same time we need them. <laughs> we don't like that, <laughs> but I mean, if we are not, let's put it this way, I mean, if we are not going to approve a universal renda basica in condition, and we need cash transfers. <laughs> and even, even when we know all the problems that are uh, attached to this kind of problems. And it, another observation is like this discussion about universality and focalization. Normally, and you did in this way, if, if I understood your presentation, is put uh, looking at social expenses only, not taxes. And maybe this, uh, these two categories are interesting to look at taxes. And, and maybe, I mean, I normally put the discussion in this way when, when I share a table like this one with people from the World Bank or this kind of, say, look, you, you like focalization for social expenses, but you like universalization for taxes. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, and for taxes, you want to tax consumption, you want to value add the tax, you want to tax energy, etc., etc. And for expenses, you want to focalize the poor. Why don't we think in the, in the other way, in the way around? I mean, why don't you focalize the rich in taxes and you universalize the poor? I mean, I, I think uh, it's just to, 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 to uh, reinforce the idea that this idea of universalization, we still have to <laughs> put the hands deeply in this discussion. And if you think uh, uh, on this 
social protection system as an integrated system, including taxes and expenses, not only expenses, uh, this, this kind of uh, discussion gets uh, more, more, more interesting. Uh, what else? Uh, not much more. Uh, uh, what I didn't, I, I would like to listen, Renata. Uh, now you have information, as far as I know, a deep information of more or less 50 million people in Bolsa Familia, and you, you go with other programs, and let's put 60, 70 million people. You know what they are doing every day to put in this way. Uh, in what, what is your experience and in what sense this kind of technology, social technology, has increased the, uh, how can I put this, the social control over this population. I mean, all discussion about social protection, I mean, because normally conditionalities are sold with the promotion marketing. We are going to promote uh, health, promote education, human capital. Uh, and in this, in this sense, I would just quotation, I think it's the first time, at least in Latin America, uh, that we just try to get these two different objectives with the same instrument our meaning, fight poverty and improve human capital with just one program. As, look at, looking, you know, you look at the history of our systems, it's the first time, and still we don't have clear, I mean, you look at Mexico evaluation, etc. it looks like it's not working. And maybe, and I think and, and this, this kind of uh, technology, uh, is at the same time is complemented at the same time with other things that normally people don't don't quote. For instance, in education and even in health, we are looking mainly at how many people is within the system <laughs> uh, matriculation, etc. We increase the number of people that is in the educational system. Since there is a conditionality for that, go to the education and to the health system. But at the same time, all the evaluations about performance of people in the education system are really bad. <laughs> so what are, are any kind of, uh, again, talking about interrelation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I think this is a topic that uh, should be taken into account. Well, I have more things, but I really tired. And <laughs> what up? Ah, again, this 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 story of commodification and decommodification. Uh, I agree with you that maybe Spin Anderson is not using uh, uh, the category uh, in a way that we we like, but at the same time, still, as, uh, I think it's it's, a, it's an interesting category. But, and this is related with your uh, comments about basic income, warranty, etc., etc., etc. Question is, uh, if we want to decommodify, it's okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, work, uh, labor needs, let's put it in this way, We really need a basic income. I mean, is is I mean, maybe, we, but not only a basic income, but a basic income plus public health, public education. I think this is the debate. I mean, maybe we can discuss if we want or we don't want to commodify, the commodify the the the, the labor needs. But uh, the big problem in, was 
always a problem, and I think now is really, really, <coughs> I don't know how to solve it, <laughs> uh, related the protection of the needy or vulnerable, whatever you want to call them, is that still income from labor yeah. is the main income for them. But at the same time, we don't have labor. <laughs> we don't have employment. Or the employment we are given to them is very precarious or is very vulnerable. And, and I think we have to discuss when we talk about universalism, focalization, social protection, we have to discuss more about this topic. Because the social protection system were built under the assumption that people have jobs. And this assumption is not sustainable anymore. And at the same time, and normally this is not well said, the golden age of welfare state was a male golden age of the welfare state. Women were not in the labor market. Uh, so if women were in the labor market in the 40s and in the 50s, surely we did not got this unemployment rate that, rates that we had at that time. I mean, it's like, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, all this discussion about universalism, about focalization, etc., needs to be uh, put in relation with changes in the labor market. And in order to see uh, how efficient our policies are and uh, how suitable they are in order to cover the needs uh, of, of the population. Just that. Thank you very much. And again, thank you very much for your two quite interesting and challenging presentations. Thanks. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Well, I was the secretariat of the the of uh, Minister of Social Development on uh, concerned with evaluation issues. And I'd like to congratulate uh, Anacelia and the, the other organizers of this, this, uh, this seminar. It's very interesting. Unfortunately, I, could, uh, I couldn't be yesterday, but the presentations that you, you show us was very interesting and brought many issues very important to our our present discussion in Brazil. So I'd like to, to make two, uh, two or three uh, questions to Andrew and Renata uh, that may be interesting for our debate. For Andrew, I'd like to, uh, I think uh, for many, I wouldn't say many, but for some Brazilian researchers, uh, it sounded strange to see Canada <laughs> being classified by Spin Anderson uh, as an Anglo Saxonian uh, welfare state. And it was very interesting to see your reaction about that. But I think you were overreact on, on, on Spin Anderson formulations because uh, you still, wow, well, it's a classic, and you also die, your, your dialogue with. Uh, with his formulation, but I think Canada is very, you could say, some empirical perceptions about the English uh, part and the, the French, the Quebec, the Quebec portion, if there, there are differences uh, in the social protection uh, policies, even because uh, Concerning one of, the, one of the things that Spin Anderson said was that in French you had a very well in French you had a, a central a very strong central government and I I don't know if it it, it applies to Quebec this idea and in the United States one of the reasons for not having a a, a, a more welfare state is the reason because you have too many, well, the political, power, the, the political power or the state capabilities was very decentralized. And I, I'm asking you if you, uh, if you see in, in, in Canada these two uh, 
futures of state capacities in the English part and the French part and how it could be uh, a reason to explain eventual difference be of the this, this social policies between these two, two areas. And in case of uh, Renata, uh, I, th I thought it was very uh, was very important presentation because he brings some of the the questions that are not treated by other researchers on to act to well to explain the success of Bolsa Familia dropping the poverty rates in Brazil. We we and even the Minister of Social Development never never thought about all the, the, the dropping of, of poverty rates were, were, were due to, to Bolsa Familia. And even the government, well, uh, in some way, the, the, the minimum wage in policies, the SUA's, the SUA's role, the Cadastro Unico is a, very, is, a, is a very important issue that is not treated as a, as a tool of, uh, an important tool to to a broader perspective of poverty, like like Renata said, and so I, I think Renata it would be very interesting to to also say about uh, a little bit more about SUAs and the how was the structuration or institutionalization of SUAs in Brazil. I think you might don't don't have the numbers. Yeah, it should, it should be interesting to show for the international audience how how fast was this institutionalization about the equipment, about the people at local level uh, involved on in that and and thing, just to show uh, that the well the expansion of Bolsa Familia and also as you said. It was an expansion of the coverage, but was the expansion uh, with a focus, a, a, a very uh, intelligent focus on, on, on the vulnerable people. And it was not possible if it was made by a federal, only by a federal agency. I think it, it would be very interesting, uh, as you said, the importance of the local governments on the implementation issues because people from other countries may not, or even in Brazil, may not have understood how important was this implementation is issues at local level. Uh, I, I, gostaria de, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the, this <coughs> program, this, this think tank inside the ENCT, PIPED, uh, which is NUPA. Uh, and it's a nucleus to, uh, for evaluation uh, of uh, public policies, analysis and evaluation of public policies. And it was created this year and it promise, promises uh, a good work ahead. So, any other question? Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Enzo. Um, I am a bureaucrat here in, of the state of Rio de Janeiro from the planning department, but I work in the uh, social assistance and human uh, rights state department since uh, 2012. So I'm very interested in this uh, conference and especially on this uh, table here. Uh, I also am studying the, the state uh, role the role the state as a subnational um, level has in the formulation and uh, implementation of uh, social assistance policies, um, mainly in the three areas of the uh, Brazil uh, without extreme poverty plan, in its three areas, cash transfer, right, uh, both familia, access to health and education, and uh, productive uh, inclusion. And uh, from uh, what I have seen, uh, the states, uh, they can uh, play uh, an important role in, the, in this implementation and formulation process um, of implementing the, the policies in the national systems. 
even though, as uh, Renata said, the federal and the municipal levels have the main responsibilities, right, in the regulation process. Um, ar around like 13 states in Brazil from 2011 to 2014 have uh, implemented their own uh, income cash transfer programs, uh, usually complementing the grant uh, transferred by uh, Bolsa Família. And the state of Rio de Janeiro is one of them. And, uh, and I think in our case here in Rio de Janeiro, uh, we have uh, some uh, pilot projects and um, uh, like uh, some pioneer uh, strategies. Uh, in the case of ca income cash transfer programs, for, for example, uh, I believe we have uh, been able to use the Cadastro Unico, as uh, Paulo Januzzi uh, said, as, in, as, a, as a tool for uh, better planning the policies. Uh, so we have a, a different strategy here for targeting the beneficiaries using a lot of uh, variables uh, available there in the Cadastro Unico to select the beneficiaries and other uh, policies um, related to education and uh, productive uh, inclusion. And uh, what I uh, was going to ask uh, Renata, first I would like uh, to uh, address the issue of the state in implementing and formulating the uh, social assistance policies, as we were uh, talking here in the break. Uh, and what is the most uh, relevant capacity dimension in the implementation, implementation of both the family and, and the social assistance policies, in, uh, in your opinion, uh, considering your studies? Uh, and how do you evaluate the inter Democratic integration, I believe that was the term used yesterday by Alexandre Gomid. Um, how do you evaluate this uh, inter bureaucratic integration in the implementation of social assistance policies in Brazil? Um, and in, the, in your presentation, uh, when you were talking about the capacity of uh, implementing social assistance. What are you, uh, in the end, uh, trying to evaluate? Is it uh, the provision of the uh, policy? Uh, I remember you mentioned three dimensions. Uh, and how do you um, escape a methodological uh, problem of uh, endogeneity? when trying to uh, 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 assess this uh, inference, this causality between these variables. Thank you very much for these interesting presentations today. My name is Fabricio Rodriguez, and uh, I'm a scholar of international relations. I come from Ecuador, where I study. I'm a doctoral student at uh, the University of Freiburg in Jena, in Germany. And I am interested in the, in the external factors that allow or constrain the provision of social assistance programs in this case. So my question is uh, directed to Renata. Um, is there a link uh, between the commodity boom and like oil, expanding oil exports and the revenues coming from that sector and the capacity of the Brazilian state to provide uh, and fin finance uh, specific areas and how dependent has Brazil become and from this specific kind of external factor? That's one question. And the other one is directed to Andrew. Uh, I was wondering in terms of, of, of your critical eye on aid programs in, in the specific context of developing countries and cash transfers. So I was wondering if these kind of programs that push for the adoption of cash transfers as a social uh, policy or mechanism, actually, are they tied into any kind of conditioning on behalf of the recipient countries to kind of pour their own portion of financial stakes into it? Or is this just uh, kind of anti-financial flows 
going into these countries and there's probably a variation across different kinds of countries and settings. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Natalia Koga for, uh, from ENAP, the National School of Public Administration. I have a quick question for Renata regarding uh, two factors. One is the op operationalization of her framework on state capacities and the other on the bureaucrat's view uh, on both the street level and the federal bureaucrats in the implementation of uh, Bolsa Familia and also in the SUA system. Uh, so the first one would be more related to uh, how to differentiate the, the capacities necessary for the municipal level and the federal level or even the state level, if you have any elaboration on those uh, in, in both cases, for SUAs and also for Bolsa Familia. And on the bureaucrats, uh, I would ask if, if we understand the Bolsa Familia a success uh, case of implementation, and if we consider that the bureaucrats have an uh, important role on that, and if we also consider state capacities as a stock of conditions for uh, implementation, uh, what happens with the bureaucrats who helped the, 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 the way that uh, Bolsa Familia and the SUAS used to operate now that we have the, a change in the agenda? Is it possible to activate those stocks again? Or what are the interference that they have with the different bureaucrats that they are coming? If it's something that you are looking at as well. Thanks so much. Okay, so thank you very much for really interesting questions. I will start with Ruben Lovolo. I really enjoyed your comments, and I will try to comment some of them. Uh, okay, first of all, considering the evaluations on SUAS, uh, we have a lot of data. Brazil is a really uh, data-rich country, but for instance, we have something that is called Census SUAS, which is a huge data set on the system. But we have much more data on coverage and equipment and implementation indicators, and we do not have good indicators for the results of social assistance, especially in the case of services. Because the goal is, is tricky, you know, how we can prevent and fight vulnerabilities of different kinds, how we can foster ties and bonds between people. So we do not have good indicators considering this. But we do have good indicators considering the whole system, you know, in the sense Paulo Januzzi was talking about. We have good data on how many public equipments if uh, each municipality has, how many social workers, how many psychologists we have in each unit, etc., etc. But we are still thinking about good data considering uh, outputs and outcomes for social assistance services, okay? And we, the implementation of these services vary a lot. We have a, a service called PAIF, Programa de, de Atenção Integral à Família. It's a, a program uh, targets at families. And it's quite tricky to see how it varies a lot all across the country. But I think we, we should go further on this. And we have really good uh, qualitative research being carried out on this by Luciana Jacou, for instance, at IPEA. Uh, but I think we should go, we need more data on this. I totally agree with this idea of substitution of agendas from basic income. And the law is from 2004, and both families 2003, so we are totally right. Uh, but okay, and I think the debate on the quality of service is quite important, you know, because in Brazil we do have this perverse thing that Celia Lessa is quite precise in showing that even poor people, once they, they get access to uh, a new level of income, they are buying services in the private sector, you know. We have an expansion of private health system, you know, we have poor people putting their kids in private school with terrible quality, you know, and this association in Brazil is quite perverse, that public services have low quality, therefore I will put my, my kids in, in, into the, the private sector. I think we should look at this. But I do not think that Bolsa Familia will solve this. You know, we should look at the, the, the problems Bolsa Familia has and how we can go further in the debate 
of how we can improve the quality of services. And uh, another issue here is how we can build a social basis for social services, public services, you know, because it's uh, William Julius Wilson's discussion in the US. Once the middle class has moved, and now even the poor people are moving out. So how we are going to support the public services? You know, how we are going to, you know? It's a funding issue and also a matter of social support. What kind of social coalitions we have trying to, to, to protect this public universal services? I think this is a issue related to the idea of segmentation. I agree with you, you know, how we can think about the whole uh, Bolsa Familia has on social segmentation. And I think there are several dimensions here. I think there are some divisions that Bolsa Familia make, even among the poorest, you know. Sometimes we are discussing, oh, you are more vulnerable than me, you are poorest than me, I deserve and you don't. But at the other side, we also have very, really good empirical work on women empowerment, you know because they have the benefits and they can make choose, so it's tricky. And I totally agree with you, Ruben. We have a lot of change in the labor market in the poverty conditions. And, you know, it's a, a moving scenario. And we have to, to develop more complex analysis and to think about the side effects of this kind of benefit, you know. Yeah, the, the issue of heterogeneity of society, how to build social co coalitions, I think this is a main issue. And yeah, considering social bonds, it's a whole discussion that we can have later. Okay, uh, ah, okay, data on uh, uh, Bolsa Familia beneficiaries. I think this, in this matter of social technologies and instruments of public policies. I think here it's really interesting to see how Cadastro Único as Paulo has stressed, it's a really important tool, but as any other tool, it may be used for social control as well. We can use Cadastro Unico, as Enzo has pointed, to include people to do the, what we call buscativa, active search for people excluded from the benefit, but we can also use the, this tool in a really liberal way. Okay, oh, you don't deserve, or you should, should work in order to be allowed to receive this benefit and things like that. For instance, in Chile, they have this huge map of all the benefits people are accessing. You know, it's like a, the Foucaultian panoptic, you know, is what we are <laughs> looking at. We, we really want to map all the benefits and all the social circuits. And I think this is the issue uh, Patrick Legale and Pierre Lacombe are expressing, you know, how different social uh, technologies may be used for different purposes. And I think we should look uh, at this, how Cadastro Único may be used for social control, especially at the local level, you know. We have a really important discussion on the moral vision of poverty and how street-level bureaucracies deal with this, and I think this is a big issue, for sure. Uh, okay, so many questions, I will try to be. Paulo, I agree with you, I think it's important to, to and I, I, I pass it really quick fast on this. It's important to understand the, the role the local level has in the implementation, you know. It's impossible to understand how both Familia reached all this, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's before. You know, municipalities in Brazil, no, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah? Okay. Uh, the, yeah, and I skip at the state level, I, I'll go back to this. The municipal level, in the case of social assistance, is in charge of organizing the services according, supposedly according to the federal normative regulation. Okay, the federal level is in charge of the main decision-making process, the national parameters, what does social assistance mean? What is basic social assistance? What is high complex complexity social assistance? And in the case of both Familia, the Cadastro Único and the main eligibility criteria are defined at the federal level, but the municipal level, through the uh, social assistance equipment units, are in charge of enrolling the, the beneficiaries and are in charge of controlling the conditionalities. And this is done using the social assistance equipment. And at this level, 
the social assistance workers, uh, for social workers and other workers, are in con constant interaction with other bureaucrats. You know, but this varies a lot, Enzo. You know how the conditionalities push for social policies integrations. I, I'm not so optimistic, you know, because we have a lot of protocol relations, you know. We have a lot of flows and information data, but it doesn't mean that people are really interacting and thinking together about what kind of integration we can have at the local level. I don't think it's enough to have health and uh, education conditionalities in order to reach a more systemic uh, perspective on social integration. And going back to you, the state level has a really important role in coordinating uh, the municipality because it's a little bit crazy to think that Brasilia is going to have a re direct relationship with, with uh, 5,600 municipalities. You know, it's, it, it's not going to happen. You know, and it's, it, since Brazil is so heterogeneous, we have to take this into account. And I think it varies a lot. The kind of uh, it's not only a matter of capacities. For sure, richer states like Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, Minas Gerais have their own benefits and services, but it's also a matter of political agendas. You know, If you compare Renda Cidadã in São Paulo and the kind of programs Rio de Janeiro have, it's a whole different world. You know, And the kind of perspective social assistance has. For instance, in São Paulo, we still have Fundo de Solidariedade. We are still back in in, in the 90s, you know, we are talking about a different time. We are still discussing that if we have SUAS in Sao Paulo, what does it mean to implement SUAS in a state like Sao Paulo? So, yeah, for sure, the state has a whole, but it varies a lot considering uh, the kind of capacities and agendas. And this is really important. Okay, I, I will finish. It's not only a matter of capacities. Capacity is a structural kind of argument. You know, it's a potential for action. You know, we should look at of what kind of projects and political agendas put forward some cap some policies and not others. Going back to the discussion we had yesterday, I I don't think state capacity or bureaucratic capacity as Selena stated, and then we are talking about different things. Uh, are a good predictor of social policies. I think we should look at other dimensions. It's not sufficient to look at this. You know, okay, do we have, we do need bureaucrats with uh, qualification, stable rules for, for improving the career, etc., etc. But how all these dimensions are put in movement, you know, this is why I think we should look at governance patterns, not in the, in governance is another terrible uh, concept because it's quite tricky and go back to new public management. Okay, but this is the point, how we can look at politics and state capacity, you know, it's not only a matter of uh, structural dimensions. I think this is the main issue for me. And this is why I'm interested in, in a relational perspective. What kind of actors are interacting in what kind of arenas regulated, but what kind of rules? On, okay, and once we look at the federal dis uh, dimension in Brazil, in the case of SUAS, it's quite interesting to see what is happening at CITI, Comissão Intergestores Tripartite, and how uh, local agendas organized by the state level reach the federal level, you know, and how this deliberation affects the SUAS, affects the, the decision making at the national level and goes back as normative acts that constrain the local level, you know. This is, this is quite an interesting game, you know, and this federal uh, induction is not enough. For sure there are some leverage for decisions at the local level. It's not it's not only a matter of, oh, the, the federal level decides everything and then the, it's only a matter of implementation. You know, implementation is not execution of public policy. You know, we are deciding and adapting at the local level. Uh, I think I don't have time to go to all this. Uh, we can discuss during the, okay, the interbureaucratic integration, not so optimistic. I think we should do more qualitative and case studies. I'm doing this in other policies in order to compare who is really integrating with whom and what are the conditions for this. Again, I don't think capacity 
uh, even for implementation, I, I'm looking at uh, funding, human resources, institutional are arenas, but also at policy communities at the local level. And I think this is another concept we should go back for. You know, what kind, how we can think about the, the profile of the, the Secretary of Social Assistance and what kind of connections do they have or not with the, the social assistance policy community, what kind of agendas are in dispute, who is trying to regulate whom, you know, civil society organizations are quite, re quite important at the local level and sometimes they completely dominate the scene. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm looking at these dimensions, and I'm going back to social, social network analysis in order to do this, but I don't have time to explain this now. We can discuss later. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, I feel like Robert Wade now. I'm the only thing between you and lunch. So, uh, but uh, let me, uh, fantastic questions. Um, it's actually really great to be here to receive them. Uh, so I'll try and do justice, but be brief at the same time. Uh, start with an easier one for me. Uh, you're, uh, Pablo, <laughs> I think you're right. I think sometimes academics were guilty of trying to differentiate ourselves by critiquing our forerunners. <laughs> but uh, no, obviously I have a huge respect for Esping Anderson's work. And as I said, what I really like is, you know, his first chapter in his book on the political economy analysis is fantastic, I think. It's brilliant. I just then get disappointed when he just derails into a whole typological exercise. Um, but but even there, you know, I, uh, what I find essential, when I, I'm not interested by the classification of welfare types, I'm interested by his causal explanation of what drives welfare state development as in sort of the class mobilizations, cross-class alliances, and then path dependence. But to a certain degree, I mean, he's just basically restating Robert Brenner's own thesis about the agrarian origins of capitalism in his, you know, his uh, 1976 article. Uh, if you actually, I have it in mind, f page 56, uh, he actually has more or less says the same thing. Uh, so how is it different? And is it, is it, you know, is, is through the, through the analytical, uh, my preference is to go back to that more sort of historically rooted uh, type of political economy analysis of Barrington Moore, Robert Brenner, Tedes Gokbul, and so on, where I find the analysis is really rich and leads us in a better direction. Whereas I feel that, you know, despite the fact that I really appreciate his contributions, I find the detour into typologies has been really unproductive. Um, but, uh, oh, no, I mean, it's had some useful contributions. And about Canada, I mean, yeah, my, my thing about Canada is that it's um uh it's about the health and education in the UK as well lumping the US the UK and Canada together makes sense in terms of social assistance doesn't make sense in terms of health and uh, education uh and Canada's like the UK in that sense um but it's interesting the question about Quebec and 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 the anglophone parts of Ontario, uh, Canada I mean, I think there are differences, and in Quebec, the idea of social solidarity is much more important, I think, than in Anglophone parts of Canada, where it's much more of uh, like a social social solidarity corporatist type of uh, uh, mentality, so to speak, that drives. Uh, so it's one of the few areas in Canada where collective collect uh, cooperatives have been very strong. We have this uh, Desjardins, the Cas Desjardins, uh, is, is really a massive, one of the leading, world leading cooperative banking networks that still remain cooperative, hasn't been sort of uh, uh, financialized the way a lot of cooperatives have in the US and so on. Uh, but that being said, I think the commonalities are also very strong um, a, in the sense that it, it adopts a more or less residualist welfare uh, social assistance uh, combined with universalistic health and, and education. Uh, and, and I think also the thing about Quebec is that I think Quebec missed the French Revolution <laughs> in the sense that, you know, they, 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 and, they, and right up to the 20th century it was dominated by the Catholic Church and then the, the Quebecois were very much marginalized in the rural areas and kept quite at low levels of education by the church. And the whole Quiet Revolution was about rejecting that, uh, the Révolution Tranquille and sort of the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, and, and, and as a result, it became actually quite left. I mean, René Lévesque was, he was social democrat, but very socialist in inspiration. And, but the irony is that in the 90s, the Parti Québécois became neoliberal, sort of independence is good for business, instead of it being based on a social model. Uh, and, the, and then now, actually, the Quebec is one of the leading provinces in Canada for actually uh, a, a, a sort of, to a certain degree, retrenching the welfare state. So um, it's, 
it always has to be, we have to look at it historically, not just freezing it in time. But anyways, to the more challenging questions. Um, uh, I lived in Quebec for a while, so I have, uh, you know, Montreal's wonderful. But um, the, uh, <laughs> I, very quickly on Europe following behind Latin America, I mean, at the break, Jose Miguel and I were just discussing, and, and as he was pointing out Juliana's study, basically the thing about Latin America is her conclusion was that they're basically, besides a few exceptions, there is no welfare state. So the thing about Europe is even though they're retrenching, they're retrenching from the basis of quite of a strong welfare state. So it makes it very different from the dynamics in Latin America, uh, where you're trying to build something on an extremely fragmented uh, basis. Um, uh, and also in terms of the system, I mean, I appreciated your comment on the system because the way I prefer to approach it, and this is perhaps, again, a slight appreciative critique of the more institutionalist literature, which, like Strike and Talen and Mahoney and Talen, they explicitly say we're adopting an approach to institutions that looks at formal political institutions, not informal institutions. And it leads to a strong state-centric bias. Whereas coming from a more population-centric perspective from social policy, I prefer to think in terms of social provisioning systems to look at the range of actors who are involved in performing the functions of social protection, whether that be the state, private sector actors, the church, community organizations, to understand how an entire population population accesses the functions of social protection. And I think that's an agenda. It's something I've been wanting to write out, but I think that's a way, a more useful way uh, to approach a, a systemic understanding of the function of social protection rather than defining social protection specifically as the state department that does social assistance. And then, then we just, well, there's this department, that department, it all becomes fragmented and so on. Um, so, but it's, that's a project for the future. Uh, maybe we should all get together and discuss that for the next seminar. <laughs> but um, uh, the ideas of substitution, yes, completely. Um, I was going to say a few things about that, but um, um, interesting thing about the basic income being taken out of the debate. On country specificities, and again, this is something that I'm playing with right now in our research project and with my PhD students, is that on one hand, yes, and the institutionalist literature, uh, the literature on policy diffusion, and a lot of these different literatures emphasize the fact that local context matters in terms of the evolution of particular types of social policy systems. And yet, we see if we look beyond the trees and look at the forest, we see strong commonalities in certain periods of time about how certain agendas are pushed forward. Uh, whether it's in cash transfers, whether it's capital account liberalization, whether it's other types of things. And the tension is to understand within the co country specificity, specificities, why do we still nonetheless end up with a lot of convergence and, and or conformity in certain policy agendas? And I, mean, I think sometimes we can get too focused on the minutia of differences in different cash transfer programs rather than looking at this as a globally pushed agenda. And now whether that's through aid mechanisms or whether it's through ideational, ideological influences or whether it's through uh, uh, epistemic communities or, or, or local political economy factors that just, even though they're different in each context, happen to result in, in, in sort of the political uh, bargain leading in that direction. Th this is the challenge that we really have to try and figure out from a comparative perspective. I, I'm trying to do that with my PhD students. Um, the... Um, so maybe in a couple of years I can give you some better answers. But uh, but I do think also, I think that it also reflects to a certain degree the dominance of this, the success in a sort of in, uh, uh, a subconscious indoctrination of the neoliberal agenda and, and also supply side, you know, what we could call also supply side economics in the sense that, um, I mean, ironically, supply side economics in from the perspective of social provisioning becomes a demand side approaches to social provisioning. So we're emphasizing uh, giving cash to people to access services rather than looking at the supply side of the supply of the services and how to address. So, I mean, you need both. You need two wings to fly, or birds do. Uh, but, but, um, the, but, uh, but the point is, is that supply side economics, on one hand, has emphasized 
in an economic policy, a supply, you know, a supply side approach, as we know, uh, in terms of non-intervention uh, in, in 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 various economic policies, but on the social policy side, has from the recipient point of view or from the uh, service provisioning point of view, has has translated into a very much demand side focused agenda where the emphasis is all put on on supporting demand for services rather than the looking at the quality of the supply of the services ironically it's kind of, it's kind of ironic in a sense when you think of it that way um, and um, um, and on the social the role of social policy and social stratification uh, in how the systems were set up in Europe I mean that's actually one point where I say Esther Esping Anderson has really good points and he says that actually exactly in the 50s when you had a much more sort of af post war homogeneous setup in European countries it was easier to establish universalism and as and he predicted in 1990 when he wrote his book that universalism itself had a built-in mechanism that would erode political support for universalism as society became increasingly differentiated and middle classes started to want to have more differentiated types of services and I think he's completely right about that and I think that was a very important observation um, uh, and of course in in the Latin American context obviously we have to translate that more into the structural the structural basis of social differentiation in Latin America and as you were pointing out the high degree of informality um, and how that feeds into how we practice these things uh, here uh, let me not say much more about that um, uh, and also but also I mean I think this is why I think it's unfortunate Celia Kirstenetsky is that how you say it? Uh, is not here because I, I know she's discussed and we've also exchanged emails about how these, how this, how the processes of social differentiation undermine support for universalism, and then thereby undermine its political and institutional sustainability. And we see that in, even though the the structural basis of political support or lack thereof in Latin America is very different from Europe, we see a similar. And this is what we referred to yesterday um, with reference to the presidentialism and so on, a sort of unstable. Uh, support that it quickly becomes eroded for these types of social protection policies and I know she's been writing about that and um, uh, on the on the issue of the ex on the taxes instead of expenses I mean I suppose I was trying to address that by my financing dimension because the financing dimension the indirect principle versus direct principle refers to uh, a basically taxation that funds the social protection system so I mean you look at I mean, we always look at Sweden as the great, you know, as the, as the, as as the land of milk and honey in terms of social policy, but uh, it, like, yeah, they have a progressive income tax financed daycare. I mean, when I had my two young children, I was dreaming of that, uh, where you you have uh, basically free daycare, quality free daycare with daycare workers who are properly trained and properly salaried uh, being paid through the taxation system uh, versus, uh, well, you know, very, various degrees going to the extreme of a you pay for daycare up to a little or you pay for daycare a lot and so on. Quebec's different than other parts of Canada in that sense. Quebec instituted in the 90s really interesting. You pay five dollars a day for daycare and it's you know you have very accessible daycare. <laughs> so but definitely the financing side is extremely important to look at and I completely agree with you <coughs> and it's, it's especially if we look at social policy from a systemic perspective Tandika Makandewiri makes this point drawing off other people uh, he, he does an exercise where if you include the tax side you know to look at how uh, well look at his look at his paper it's really good um, um, and it's also interesting this irony uh, where you are making the irony about how we, you know, target in, in social protection, but not in taxes or something, or how we target. But there's also the point, Makandawiri makes this point, how uh, the, the sort of the Washington consensus or whatever we want to call it, uh, emphasizes targeting in social protection, but is against targeting in industrial policy. <laughs> so uh, this is, this is um, and also I think there is an interest, I, I, South Korea provides a really interesting example. I was looking at some OEC data on it, and where you have, if you compare countries in terms of their pre and post uh, wage inequality uh, and the role of 
redistribution through taxing and spending uh, uh, in correcting the wage inequality. So if you look at the Scandinavian countries, pre-tax, they're actually extremely unequal. They're more unequal than, say, uh, the U uh, well, the UK at least. They're up in the range of the... But post-tax, because they have a very heavy taxation system, they, they, they're they reduced to a very low level of in inequality. Korea, post-tax, is at about the same level of in wage inequality as Sweden, say. But they do it through compressing wage inequality and having very little redistribution. So uh, uh, so the, the redistributive effect of taxing taxation in Korea is quite small, actually. But it's on the basis of having a very uh, equal wage structure, uh, which is quite fascinating. Actually, we need to take these structural considerations into mind when we talk about social policy, I think, definitely. Uh, and we need to bring the structure back into political economy and not just be talking about institutions in that sense. And as a very last point, before we run off to lunch, I had something about the social technology, but I'll skip that. Uh, it's the very last point on commodification. And I think it, it's a really thought-provoking question. And I think it goes to the heart of of basically the debate between Marxists, Marxist and post-Marxist interpretations of Polanyi, in a sense. Because, um, and I, I don't know, if Fred Bloch was here, maybe we could have a discussion about that. But in a sense, the, the, I mean, the more Marxist interpretation of Polanyi, which would be represented by his daughter, for instance, Kairi polanyi Levitt, is that, you know, we have to understand that um, there's embeddedness and there's commodification. And, and I think the thing is, is that the welfare state attempted a, a temporal fix of the contradictions of capitalism by trying to re-embed, so to speak, in those Polanyian terms, the economy into society without decommodifying labor. And the lack of decommodification of labor is ultimately what undermines, the, that results in the, the, sort of the contradictions uh, of, 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 of that solution which breaks down over time. And I think that's probably the, the way Polanyi would have analyzed the rise of neoliberalism in that sense. Uh, and, and, um, and so in, in a sense, I mean, that's the socialist response to the social, the social Democrats are like, can we fix the system through basic income, cash transfers, welfare states, and so on. And, and the socialist response is that we need to decommodify labor but in a serious sense, and the question is, does basic income grants really actually decommodify labor? I don't, I don't think so in that sense, right? I think the, 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 the more sort of Marxian interpretation of Polanyi and understanding of commodification is a much deeper sense of commodification. And what that is exactly, I mean, you know, Polanyi always said socialism is that we can act as socially conscious beings in, 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 in terms of the way our, our actions impact you know, uh, r rather than working in this market where, anyways, whatever. That's another discussion, but I think it's, it's a fascinating point. I think it's something that we could explore much further. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, so I didn't address your question on that, but we can discuss, that would require a whole other presentation. <laughs> Thanks. First, I, I forgot to ask Renata. Uh, at the very end of your presentation, you are saying that uh, the current government is moving to a more liberal agenda. But for many people, programs like Bolsa Familia are part of the liberal agenda. So it just, yeah. uh, they, 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 so, and in this sense, going back to, to Andrew, maybe one of the dimensions to explore in this discussion between universalism or whatever is, uh, which kind of policies are more, uh, how can I say, it, 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 are more probably to be moved uh, or, or, or to be, mm, let's put it, to be dismantled, to put in Paul Pearson's way. I mean, it's like, and it seems like, uh, just to leave a question, that it's more easy to dismantle or to, uh, let's use, with other objective, a focalized program that universal one. That just, I just leave this. Yeah. And just at, at the end, this discussion of the regime, I think that in, in your, in, in, I mean, in, in the type of, of approach that you want to do, I think Jan Goff, 
uh, at Bath, uh, at the Bath oh, University, yeah, yeah, he did yeah, yeah. he did this yeah. kind of approach, putting in the same uh, framework, family, state, market. Okay, just that. Uh, well. Well, eu já estou falando português, já estou... Uh, Ruben, I totally disagree with this idea. Uh, I'm thinking about Lena Lavinas, for instance, in that article on New Left Review. She's stressing this, that uh, Latin America has a really liberal approach. I disagree, I don't think we, we have. And I think now it's much clearer the difference, you know, and we are totally moving towards a more means-tested benefits, you know, a more fiscalist approach on CCT is going to get so much worse that we will think that, that PT was almost social democratic, you know. But I, I, uh, this is the, my point. I think there is a problem with the analytical lens. It's not only about both family. Both family is not the main issue, you know. This is why it's not liberal. There are other things going on. But thank you. Okay. So we invite you for lunch now and close the panel. Thank you very much.